I'm your host, Dr. Srikanth Sola, founder and CEO of David Earth. And today I have the honor of speaking to Mr. Thakur Firvani. He's Global Head of Safety, Health, Environment and Sustainability at Dr. Reddy's Laboratories. It's one of the largest pharmaceutical companies in the world. Now in Thakurji's career of almost two decades, he's been instrumental in spearheading sustainability initiatives and innovation at companies like Cadbury, Unilever, uh, Coca-Cola and Amazon, and his innovative initiatives in cross-industrial areas and environment uh, safety and, uh, sorry, environment sustainability goals and sustainability have brought in international accolades and laurels. So Mr. Thakwe, sir, welcome to our show. Thank you. Thanks for calling me here and happy to have a conversation with you, Dr. Sula. Sure. Thank you. It's a pleasure. So uh, you've been there, done that when it comes to sustainability. And I really am happy to have you with us today and share your experience with our uh, audience. Let's start with the, the question that most people think about when it comes to sustainability is carbon. Now, we know that sustainability goes far beyond this, but when most people say sustainability, they think about becoming carbon neutral. Now, I'm talking from my background as a cardiologist, and you know I've seen companies like Dr. Reddy's provide some of the drugs that they use on a daily basis. This is not an advertisement. What I'm sharing is that I've seen mortality, death rates from coronary artery, artery disease, heart attacks, heart failure, diabetes, hypertension come down thanks to advances in these medications. How does a company like Dr. Reddy's track the carbon emissions of its various operations? What do you do? Because it's not you know, steel, cement, thermal power, where you're measuring carbons that come out of a smokestack. How, how does this happen? Yeah, so this is something which is very important element and aspect in climate change when you have to make a difference and uh, run in the direction of uh, saving the climate because it's the need of an hour. It's the most important aspect is how much carbon is emitted in the business in the entire value chain. And that's the boundary which every business have to decide. Like they want to go for an approach of cradle to grave or gate to gate, gate to customer, how they want to keep that boundary. So first and foremost important aspect is defining the boundary. And that's where we define our boundary, where when things come from a value chain partner at upstream till the point we take this material up to a downstream when it reaches to the retailer or the drugs reach to the retailer. So that within that boundary, uh, again, most important aspect is divide this in a scientific manner in terms of uh, scoping it, which is scope one and two, right. and then three, one and two, which is more server within the fence we can control. And we have a large amount of visibility that how we are going to turn it around over a period of time. And the third part, which is scope three is vast and up to what level and depth we want to cover is most important thing. So for us, what we do, we do evaluation of all these three scopes where one and two within the fence and scope three in a value chain at upstream and downstream. We evaluate, calculate, and then map where we stand in terms of the emission. Uh, there are methodologies where people opt for right from product to product, activity to activity, how to map that carbon. And few of them also we have opted. Like we are the first pharmaceutical company. The approach which we have taken is accredited and approved by SBTI and we report it out and disclose it out in, in the framework which is given by SBTI and also the GRI. So my uh, only input at this moment I would say is mapping this in a scientific manner, disclosing it in a uh, standard format is something the approach which we have taken at Dr. Eddie's. Great. And you have that then validated independently by another agency which specializes in uh, carbon mapping. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. Because validation and, and, and after that, giving you assurance document is an important link in this chain because that gives you a peace of mind that at the end of the day, some third person is coming and looking into the calculations, numbers, validating mm -hmm. it, and giving us heads up in case if there is any red flag. Great. So once you know how much emissions are being generated. I'm talking about carbon emissions here. What are the ways in which you offset? I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is renewable energy, uh, solar, wind, biogas, and so forth. What, what, is, what are you doing? So here, our actions are divided into two pieces. One, which is within the fence, within our control, how we can set first a goal around it. And I'm mm -hmm. happy to share 
uh, last week only the formal goals are released for next one decade though we started working on it since 2011 and those goals uh, were interim goals and we tried to review that in 2020 and after the materiality assessment we are able to zero down the bold goals and dr reddy has decided to be carbon neutral in its scope 1 and 2 by 2030 and uh, reduce scope 3 emission thank you uh, emission uh, by 20, 12.5% um, against the baseline of uh, 2021 and you will be uh, surprised to know that at one place in scope 1 and 2 we are talking about carbon neutrality on other side in scope 3 we are saying we'll move only 12 to 15% because we still consider 2030 is our interim period in which we would like to take an aggressive step to first neutralize what we have in our control in a scientific manner because you must appreciate that sbti do not approve the goals if the goals are going to get offset by buying the carbon credit certificate or by a greenwashing method so we have a clear defined lever through which we are going to achieve the scope 1 and 2 where anything on renewable our objective is to hop on to the solar rooftop within the fence beyond the fence joint ventures solar plant acquisitions cogen boilers uh interstate open access ppas virtual ppas and whatever portion is left out at the last how we can go for rec certificates when it comes to the scope 1 making sure that we work around energy efficiency fuel replacement green fuels biomass boilers and also carbon sequestration methods which are approved by spti which is a massive afforestation drive which can give us the better carbon uh, sequestration impact over a period of time and if you see our work which is happening in the space of mitra which is driven under the csr paradigm and part implementation partner is dr reddy foundation uh that is driving a sustainable agriculture drive which is not only creating a value addition in terms of sustainable livelihood but also giving us an impact on water neutrality and carbon sequestration so these are various uh levers which we are keeping in mind but the bottom line is we can't drive any project blindly for that we have to measure our internal carbon price so dr reddy is the first pharmaceutical company who have mapped their internal carbon pricing two years back and also disclose why this important change is important and drive towards neutrality is important because uh the recent assessment of tcfd also clearly show there is a physical risk attached to it if we are part of the problem in climate change we have to be the part of the solution also so that's how right. our scope 1 and 2 is to make carbon neutral as fast as possible which is under our scope and scope 3 which is 50% of our total carbon footprint is also a significant amount of carbon and that's where it requires first the baseline because it requires a stakeholder discussion upstream downstream there are various value chain partners with whom we need to first identify the critical strategic with whom we can understand up to what level they are doing their business baselining them training them and holding them and then right. once we set their target and set the boundaries around we can make uh, take the step forward so that's how our interim carbon neutrality of scope 1 and 2 is to get neutral by 2030 and once as we will progress maybe by fi 26 we will have a better visibility how and what road map we are going to choose with various activities and action to decide the timeline around the neutrality of scope 3 as well you know scope 3 is a big challenge for every company so uh, for the audience tucker sir has really outlined uh, very succinctly in just a few minutes uh, how uh, carbon emissions are measured um and then how they can be remediated so thank you for sharing i mean there's a lot of information you've shared with us a lot of gems and we could go on with that to our audience if you have questions you can please enter those questions in the chat box and we will ask them to sir towards the end of of today's session now carbon is one part of becoming sustainable there's also other areas such as um liquid waste solid waste management and so forth can you tell us about some of the initiatives you're taking in that areas Oh absolutely so as a responsible company we have realized being a high hazard process industry in pharmaceutical when we are generating a lot of uh waste which is not only a liquid waste but also a solid which is which is had as hazardous in nature uh in year 2010 we have taken an initiative to make sure that all our manufacturing sites which are complex in nature 
uh, I would say API business, which is active pharmaceutical in grid, uh, to establish a ZLD over there. And these ZLDs are state of art planned, though they are energy jugglers, but end of the day, it gives us a peace of mind in terms of treating every drop of water in effective manner. And also making sure that finally we converge this into a salt, which go for a co-processing in a cement industry. So it means okay. that when we converge anything and everything into a waste, waste is a wealth for someone. So that's how we bring the circularity element here to make sure that our waste go either get recycled, upcycled or processed in such a manner so that it gives benefit to someone else. So our solid waste, which is categorized into two, which is a hazardous waste and a non-hazardous waste, both the categories go in such a manner, in a responsible manner that we track and trace up to the point it finds its own path of disposal, which is going to get you know, a benefit for someone else. Similarly, compliance to EPR, which is post-consumer plastic, is also taken care with the help of our partners to take that plastic back from the market and upcycle it and converge into a meaningful product or non-recycling and upcyclable product go for an incineration. So that's what is our responsibility by virtue of a compliance or a no compliance as a responsible company, it's our job. So that's how we are managing our liquid as well as solid waste. We have not only stopped ourselves there, but also we are talking about gaseous waste, which is like an emission. Uh, right. Things which go get emitted because of uh, tons and tons of uh, solvents which we are using. How to make sure that we capture it, solvent recovery plants are established across the site. And in the business, we have integrated a KPI with respect to the yield through which we check that how much solvent uh, is getting released into a wastewater as well as in the environment. So with a robust governance around tracing, tracking, and trapping is something which is a mechanism through which we ensure that uh, we take care of the gaseous emission or the fugitive emission also. Wonderful. Now, you've how has the feedback been from, say, the cement industry for the uh, the solid waste that then gets taken into cakes? You said you turn them into salts, and then that becomes a high caloric uh, fuel for these cement kilns. How how has the feedback been from other industries for these products? Uh, for pharmaceuticals, it's welcoming because pharmaceutical waste has a high caloric value. And uh, the only challenge is initially, which we tried to iron it out and remove that bottleneck. And that was with respect to uh, liquid waste cannot directly can be fed into the clin. You have mm -hmm. to co-process in between intermediately before you take it to the clin and feed into the burner. And for that, we found uh, partners who actually mix a husk in it and make it as a semi-solid. And finally, it goes into the uh, their clin. And... So far, we have not heard any pushback or any issues or concern with respect to using this phase as a fuel to replace their virgin fuel in turn for getting the outcome. There are many, many cement industries who are even experimenting that uh, what other type of a waste can be taken into consideration, not only one single type of a hazardous waste which comes into play in a different manner. When it comes to uh, transitioning because many of the industries are now transitioning from uh, fuel fired boilers or uh, various mm -hmm. other non hazardous activities to biomass pilot fired boilers. There also there is an ash generation, and that is the only component mm -hmm. which cement industry don't take because it doesn't have a calorific value. Right, right. You can't burn it and generate heat from it. Yes, absolutely. Yes. And that's how that type of a waste, uh, the other avenue of circularity is to give it to the brick manufacturers, tile manufacturers. Okay. Uh, manufacturers who can blend it in such a manner for their byproducts and co-products. And there we don't make an investment. We even have a plan where we can get paid for that ash, which can be a value proposition for someone to sell it in the market. Okay. Ingenious. So for our audience who's listening and maybe not familiar with these topics, boilers are often used in pharmaceutical plants to, please correct me if I'm wrong, Thakur, but to generate heat that's uh, required for many of the manufacturing processes. And those boilers can be in the old days. I think a lot of them were coal fired, right? But now we have others that are running on various forms of gas, uh, LPG, and so forth. That's wonderful. Now you have uh, done a lot of work, not just within uh, Dr. Reddy's, but you also started a sustainability ambassador program to help others uh, do the same. Can you tell us about that and how has the response been to that program? 
Yeah, absolutely. Because this is something which is a dynamic program. And I strongly believe that sustainability in a current context, which is a white elephant sitting in a boardroom, tomorrow mm-hmm. will come out and it will start rendering here and there. And if you are not giving it as a path and not communicating sustainability well to the people who are actually the ambassador and who will make your policies, your target as a reality, then it will be like a misleading aspect. I mean, so mm-hmm. make sure that if the CEO release the ESG goal with the conviction, you need a workforce to make it a reality. And sustainability ambassador program is one of that program, which we have started in FI20 and it's been two years. The objective of the program is, and it is a platform which actually give a call for action where we have driven this in a six th- different thematic areas, which is waste, water, energy, road safety, women's safety, and health. And each of this dimension is linked to one or the other SDGs or overlap with multiple SDGs uh, to give them a sensitization the day when person join the organization. And this is what are the key areas where you can make a difference, not only for us as a company, but as a responsible citizen, as a responsible human being, you have some responsibility around these areas. Wherever you are, if you are an ambassador, you will not only make difference being into the company and add some value, but if at your home, in your society, you can also bring the change. And from that perspective, we made sure that people come voluntarily, they join hands, put their hands on the deck, and then it's our job to give them a training, coaching, handhold, certified them as ambassador. And journey doesn't stop there itself. The next level thing is once you are getting certified as an ambassador, you have to go with across the departments within the fence and collaborate with the CSR department beyond the fence in the schools and make sure that you make a difference and teach other people what you've learned in your sessions of being an ambassador. So that's how it is a movement where one ambassador have a target to 10 train 10 more and next year we onboard a few more ambassadors and they will train 10 more. So in 10 years down the line, every person in the organization would know what is sustainability, what is a social cause which we are trying to address, how our volunteer action is going to bring the change around. And that's how we have seen the progress in last two and a half year that 450 different ambassadors so far trained 16,000 employees and community members across our business. And we have also quantified after that training, what change these people are bringing in terms of water saving, energy saving, improving their skills on road safety, how the women is getting empowered in terms of taking decision. And also they know where to report, what to report, when to report when there is any harassment with them. So these are all six uh, social issues, which we try to pick up under social, uh, you know, sustainability ambassador program. Tomorrow, these are six can convert into 12. As more right. uh, people will come on board, we will try to expand this thing and make sure that everybody know about our goal and contribute into this journey, being a lighthouse of the society. Now, it's interesting because you've done so much in uh, this field. And also, for those of you who are listening, please send in your questions to uh, Takara Sir if you'd like to ask him anything. Uh, w- there's a lot for people to learn from you. Uh, if you were to advise someone who's working in sustainability also, what would you tell them? Is it a copy and paste approach? Can I just say, this is what works at Dr. Reddy's and I'm gonna take it into my own company and start using it. How, how does that work? See, uh, when five fingers in, in your uh, hand is not same, all are different. So similarly, keep in mind, uh, wherever you work, you can't copy paste anything and everything. Even if I have to, let's say, start a career five years down the line in another company. What I'm doing here, I will not take an approach in terms of implementation and doing the same thing in the same manner. Yes, up to an extent, you can copy paste, but that so-called is a good practice in the environment space suits a lot when it comes to energy, water, waste, or many other things, which uh, clearly indicates that what you can do differently to you know improve at your uh, organization also. But when it comes to the social and governance, and unless organizations don't perform their own materiality assessment and the risk mapping, what your stakeholder want, what type of a cross-mix product you have, how you are impacting the society and the world by and large, and what is important for you in a current context or material for you, you will not be able to define your goal or a roadmap. And that's where uh, it doesn't make any sense if you go for a cookie-cutter approach. What makes sense okay. is 
authenticity in terms of your program which is realistic related and relevant in a current context for a business and is it going to give you a good um, positioning and benchmarking over a period of time in the space in which you are it, end of the day it should give you the competitive advantage correct so there's no cookie cutter approach when it comes to implementing sustainability programs the programs have to be authentic realistic and give one a competitive approach that's brilliant now we have a question from our from, from our audience members uh, sukit singh saini he asked if uh, let's say i have a company i'm part of uh, dr reddy's uh, uh, suppliers and i want to uh, reduce my carbon emissions and i'm so that i guess I, that my carbon emissions would fall within scope 3 of how carbon emissions are quantified what is there support that dr reddy's uh, provides how do you advise your um, suppliers to help them reduce their own emissions what kind of support is there so first and foremost thing is uh, when we look at our supplier we try to see that that supplier is our strategic supplier or not and there are certain criteria which is that we define supplier is a strategic or non strategic so you have to first see where you stand out in the entire paradigm of that organization every organization will have 5 to 7000 supplier in their mm -hmm. umbrella so not everyone will get a same treatment let's understand this thing because sure. there is a there is a limited resource limited fund limited effort it has to get equated in such a manner uh, with the first priority suppliers who are going to add value for a business from business continuity point of view number type of business they do the value addition they bring and amount of business they do with the company and once if you fall under a strategic supplier i'm giving mr sani the answer to your question let's say you are my strategic supplier then you are part of my family you are my key partner who is going to decide the future of my business because it becomes like a business continuity perspective come in a picture and if that happens then three things come in picture one i need to educate you at par with what education i have around esg so it means i will okay. treat you as my own family member and give you the understanding training coaching and hold certification everything once that happens then i will tell you okay i will come and visit you and audit you about your practices it's not only about environment but also social governance many other right. aspects tomorrow if your business go for a shut and if you become a poster child in the media is it going to impact me or not so that's something which is a second criteria i mean second step where we audit the facilities and we tell them and this is how the gap look like and in my supplier framework where you stand in red amber and green in traffic light system and then uh, the improvement journey start where we say hey look this is what the goal dr reddy is have taken we are going to help you and handhold you in next 3 years time period in terms of what activities you would do to improve upon and in that journey if they sign it off and they say yes we are okay with it and we are going to make significant amount of our time and investment because one supplier if get trained and certified by one organization then that person is fungible in the market to give business to or uh, do business with others so for other Definitely. companies then it is like a cooked rice in the market you just have to pick it up and start using it Definitely. Right. You know, companies that follow sustainability, and I'm not talking about the large uh, multinational companies like uh, Dr. Reddy's, um, even small and medium companies that are, are have sustainability as part of their core values or as a core strategic area, they have better profits. Uh, they have uh, better customers. Um, they have higher customer retention and dropout and lower dropout rates. They have an easier time recruiting and retaining staff because people want to work in places. where sustainability is important to them. Now we have some questions that are coming in fast and furious. Parvati from TCS asked, when you mentioned that you're taking care of gaseous emissions, um how do you do that? What are the steps that are taken till now and um are there more things that you plan to do in the future around gaseous emissions? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, some of the areas where we use tons and tons of uh, solvents in those processing uh, plants where we have reactors or condensers we have a mechanism to capture them and route it towards a defined path uh, to solvent recovery system and solvent recovery systems are the most complex uh, you know uh, i would say operation in terms of when it comes to 
Dr. Reddy's operation in the business. It's more complex than making a manufacturing of the medicine. Uh, our job and objective is to extract as many ads or how much you can extract from that emission, uh, the, the vapors which are coming uh, and converge this into a liquid or any other form and finally sell it in the market because end of the day that has some value in it. So as a byproduct, it goes and somebody picks it up and we sell it to them. But some amount of that still in that process get lost. And that's how if you see our recoveries are 90 to 92%, it means there's still 8% of that emission which still get released in the air. There are sophisticated technologies available, which gives assurance up to 99% of the recovery of those gaseous emissions, but that take a toll on the cost and the baseline or our bottom line. So we have to always take a mid path where we see what we can do best with the available technology and how we can improvise certain stream or processes where we can work around. And that's a one part. But that's something which is, it's like the crime is already happening and you are just trying to fix it or maneuvering around it. What we are also looking into it at upstream, how we can eliminate that hazardous chemical from the product itself and make that product greener. And that's where the green chemistry come in the picture. So our effort is in the two dimension. One, making sure that what we are doing already emitting, how we can control it, minimize it, optimize it. And second, how to ensure that root cause is eliminated from the product itself, which is coming on the way. Why to make an investment in terms of extracting in a solvent recovery system when you can eliminate the solvent itself or bring or introduce the green solvent. So this, it's a two-step process. First, to start with the existing product. Second, to work with the upstream R&D scientists who are extremely talented and working alternative, on alternative route of synthesis and finding the low hazardous chemicals in terms of developing a product which is lighter, greener, and good for the, the organization and also the footprint is less in terms of water, wastewater, waste, and emission. Now, how do you inform your, your ultimately your customers are consumers, patients who are um, purchasing these medications? And I guess a secondary uh, customer, in a sense, would be doctors like me who make recommendations based on quality, cost, and other parameters, um, stream, uh, of course, individualized for the particular patient's requirements. How does this work in sustainability benefit? Uh, Dr. Reddy's, you know, sales or bottom line. What's what's the takeaway that um, that uh, you get from this? So, if you see, uh, being a pharmaceutical company, we have five key stakeholders in uh, our journey who can really make or break in terms of our reputation and how they can also recommend our company to the customers, consumers, or different other uh, people. First uh, stakeholder is our government agencies. We call them regulatory framework agencies. And that's something which we have to abide to and in letter and spirit and go beyond that. Right. Second customer for us is our investor who is making an investment in the company so that we keep getting investment and we thrive, we sustain, and we have an accountability towards that. And it is in the form of shareholder or uh, big time investors within India and beyond India. I mean, outside India also. Yeah. My third customer is my uh, doctor. Uh, who is prescribing that medicine to the patient, stating with the confidence that I believe this company is doing great. Their, their, their worth in terms of promoting in the form of their drug is safe, it is quality drug, and they're also doing great job. Right. So that's my another customer. And finally, the customer is my consumer uh, who is consuming my medicine and they have a belief by looking at what Dr. Reddy is doing. Uh, I should always look forward for a product when I go in the market because if you'll find for a generic OTC drug, for one single drunk, there are 16 players in the market. Yes. Right? There is a very least awareness available uh, among the consumer. When they go, it is completely uh, based on either a uh, doctor is recommending something, the name and the brand. Even they just write the name, not even the brand. And second, it depends on the person who is giving them a medication. Right? So it requires a high level of education and awareness on the ground in terms of uh, first promoting and talking about what company is doing, how green is their product, because it is also equally important, which is com uh, nowadays coming up for pharmaceutical industry is called AMR, antimicrobial drug resistant and yes. uh, you know, med medicine in environment or uh, pharmaceutical product in environment, PI. So this is something which is a, the concept which people don't even understand. It's like, 
tons and tons and millions and millions of tablets and syrup or injections are getting injected to the uh, patients but end of the day once that medicine goes into the body after it do its job it doesn't remain in the body it gets secreted out of your body so all those harmful chemicals which are through which we make the medicine end of the day get secreted out of your urine and fecal points and it goes into the environment into a water body and that's how those water bodies which is not getting treated either by municipality finally get either into a ground or in a river and from that river itself or our ground water once the products are getting treated or uh, in the space you can see the farmer is using that water which is contaminated or taking mm-hmm. water from a river which is contaminated it goes back into the food value chain and once it comes into food value chain we again get fed with the same contaminated items end of the day our our resistance towards that disease deplete over a period of time so if you are a customer and there's a message for everyone who is there on the call and if you will talk about the subject over a period of time with your friends and family please do buy products of those pharmaceutical industries who are thinking in the direction of pie as well as amr and working in the dimension in terms of making product lighter greener less hazardous and also making an effort towards making that product accessible affordable in the market if that pharmaceutical industry is something which is doing that all effort if you ask me i will go and buy that product first rather than uh, anything else what my doctor is writing or i will insist mm-hmm. doctor to write can you write the medication which is of x y and z company because i believe that company is doing great i can give you an example recently i have switched my entire uh, milk cheese and all different type of by product of milk deliveries from amul to milky mist why okay. because milky mist is manufacturing their product which is carbon neutral they are wow. water neutral okay. so i have an awareness up to a level that this industry is responsible they are manufacturing for their own business but end of the day they are creating an impact in environment okay so if we are not making consumer aware then there will be no pull then it is in the hands of god which is in current condition is a doctor what he writes consumer will consume i think that's a great way to end and we've got uh, really good questions from our audience but i think you've answered a lot of them um i think that last thought that uh, as consumers we can all uh, look for and support companies that are working to make their products more sustainable more environmentally friendly and available to all um i think that will go a large way in the example you gave of whether it's medications or dairy products this is something that we can all practice in our daily work uh, takar sir i want to thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us and to our audience i hope you enjoyed this session uh, we'll see you on our next session of Uh, speaking sustainably shortly thank you so much thank you dr sula thanks for this invitation and happy to connect and any time in the future also if you have some questions which are unanswered you can always write it back to me i'll happy to respond them back absolutely thank you so much take Bye-bye. care